Good evening, and welcome to the 27th annual Sterling McMurrin Lecture on Religion and Culture. My name is Bob Goldberg. I am Professor of History and Director of the Tanner Humanities Center at the University of Utah. Please take a moment to silence your cell phones and any and all electronic devices. Sterling McMurrin died in 1996. He left a profound legacy of service and scholarship. Professor McMurrin taught in both the philosophy and history departments. He served the university as Dean of the College of Letters and Science, Dean of the Graduate School, Academic Vice President, and Provost. Sterling McMurrin also held the position of United States Commissioner of, of Education under John F. Kennedy. In his name, the McMurrin Lectures on Religion and Culture were established. The goal is to provide the very best scholarship on religion to our students, faculty, and Utah community. Previous McMurrin lecturers have included Krista Tippett, Reza Aslan, Thupton Jimpa, Lester Bush, Laurel Thatchell Ulrich, and Greg Prince. Please note, tonight's lecture is the keynote address for our conference, Black, White, and Mormon, a conference on race in the LDS Church since the 1978 revelation. This conference begins at 8.45 a.m. tomorrow. Anna will be held here at the Salt Lake Public Library. Note, doors open at 8.30. Please consult your program for a listing of panelists and speakers. All panels, all panels are open and free to the public. Now, please welcome Paul Reeve, Simmons Professor of Mormon Studies at the University of Utah. He will introduce our distinguished McMurrin lecturer. Thank you. I first met Darius Gray in Buena Vista, Virginia in February of 2004. I was a new assistant professor at Southern Virginia University at the time, a small liberal arts school nestled against the Blue Ridge Mountains in southwestern Virginia. The school had never formally commemorated Black History Month and I wanted to change that. I invited Darius Gray and Margaret Blair Young to campus to speak and I am forever grateful that I did. Not only did we commemorate Black History Month at SVU, but I made two new friends in the process. Since that time, I've had a variety of interactions with Darius, and I always leave each one feeling uplifted and renewed. He has a way of making people feel like they are his only friend in the world, even though we all know that he has hundreds of others friends who feel the same way. I will never forget the lesson he taught me in Virginia about race. It is one of the most important life lessons I have learned. Darius is wise and measured, and as such, he has become a respected voice in matters of racial equality in Mormonism and in the nation. Darius works tire tirelessly behind the scenes going about doing good. It is my distinct pleasure to share with you some of his many accomplishments. Trained in broadcast journalism at the University of Utah and Columbia University, Darius Aiden Gray worked for KSL radio and television during the late 60s and early 70s. He especially enjoyed documentary film production and was privileged to be placed on loan to UNICEF to film grassroots aid projects, aid projects excuse me, in several African countries. Darius was director of, of development for the Department of Communications at Brigham Young University, where his past business and broadcast background served him well. He co-hosted Questions and Ans Ancestors, a nationally aired program on genealogy. He also participated in the highly acclaimed PBS family history series, Ancestors, produced by KBYU Television, and was involved in the KUED documentaries, Utah's African American Voices and Utah's Freedom Writers. Perhaps his greatest genealogical accomplishment was as co-director with Marjorie Taylor of the 11-year project to organize and save to CD the Friedman Bank records. This genealogy treasure contains the marriage, birth, and family records of more than 480,000 freed slaves from the 1860s and offered breakthroughs for countless African Americans seeking to trace their family trees. He was the co-author, along with Margaret Young, of an award-winning trilogy of novels about early black Mormon pioneers entitled Standing on the Promises. 
Also with Margaret, he co-produced two documentary films, Jane Manning James, Your Sister in the Gospel, and Nobody Knows, The Untold Story of Black Mormons. The latter film was featured nationwide on the documentary channel for two years. Darius has received numerous awards, recognitions, and keys to cities, but he feels most honored having been favored with two notable awards, the Martin Luther King Jr. Civil Rights Award and being named Citizen of the Year by the men of the Iota 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 chapter Omega Psi Phi fraternity. <laughs> That's where... The over 800 Omega chapters throughout the world take such selections very seriously. The tradition was started at the re request of fraternity brother and great historian Charles G. Woodson, the father of black history. In 2003, Darius was released as president of the Genesis branch of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Having served there for six years, the Genesis organization was established under the direction of the First Presidency and the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles in 1971 with the goal of providing support to Black Latter-day Saints. Please join with me in welcoming to the stand Darius Gray. I first saw you stand, I thought they're leaving already? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. <laughs> yeah, well, I know this is not a religious edifice, and this may not be a Baptist edifice, but I'm black, and there's this call and response. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you. You are now inducted. <laughs> I am pleased beyond measure uh, to be here and to see so many friends. And um, that's indeed who you are, uh, friends. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the support that you give me by your presence. Um, it means a lot. Thank you. I uh, am going to have to give way to reading this, something I typically don't do. So bear with me, and I hope the uh, trifocals don't get in the way, and uh, that I can read the words that I wrote. <laughs> but I think for the sake of time and uh, staying on topic, uh, this is the better way. Can you hear me okay? Yes. All right. It was the middle of October 2017 when an email arrived inviting me to present the 2018 Sterling M. McMurrin Lecture on Religion and Culture. In part it read, your talk titled A 54-Year Journey Toward Racial Equality in the Mormon Church will be the keynote for Black, White, and Mormon too a conference on race in the LDS Church since the 1978 revelation." Close quote. Being invited to present the McMurrin Lecture was something I never considered possible, but having been asked, my response to the Tanner Humanity Center Director, Robert Goldberg, expressed a slight note of eagerness. It read, Hello, Bob. Yes, 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 I accept. <laughs> The invitation to deliver the Sterling McMurrin lecture on, and the date has changed somewhat, to be entitled a 54-year journey toward racial equality in the Mormon church. I continued, in all seriousness, I am excited and have already begun drafting the presentation. My membership in the LDS faith is about to pass through the 53rd year and head into the 54th, during which span there have been changes, official and unofficial, that were not even dreamt of in December of 1964, the month of my baptism. 
That said, while so much has been accomplished, there is much remaining to be accomplished and to be acknowledged. It is also because of those things which have transpired, those things which decades ago were less than a dream, that today I harbor magnificent hopes for our future. Well, my hopes for our future took somewhat of a downturn as the actual process got underway. Over the intervening months, I did begin drafting what it was that I felt needed to be said tonight, realizing that in June of 2018, it would be 54 years into my personal journey, and reflecting on the 40 years since the revelation, the questions became, how far have we come? How much is remaining to be done? Are we progressing in a meaningful way? We have two computers at home. Between the two, there are seven hard drives which contain more documents than I had ever hoped to accumulate. You learn these things when you stop and start looking for particulars. Most of what I was looking for was historical in nature. Though the request from the Tanner Center was for a review of the last 54 years, it seemed logical to dig deeper into the past to better understand where exactly the LDS Church and its black members were at the beginning of those 54 years. That decision became my downfall. There were pictures, scanned documents, no shortage of ugly, racially insensitive statements from any number of prominent Latter-day Saints. Most of those comments had been made in the distant past. More troubling were the relatively newer ones. As if somehow maintaining a balance in nature, there also appeared to be an equal number of letters and copied emails from disheartened members, some of them black and others white. It seemed there were no boundaries of time or place, age or gender, just hurts. The pains and frustrations of those who had contacted me stood in stark contrast to the seemingly cold, off-handed views expressed by prior church officials again with no boundaries of time or place, age or gender. Many of the harmful comments had been written by men called to serve as God's chosen leaders. I had personally known and interacted with several of the brethren whose words were now so troubling. There was nothing new in what was being read, but at that moment the materials affected me in ways previously not known. Trying to understand the depths of my reactions, I wondered if the passage of time had allowed me to grow in love and understanding for those harmed, as well as having contributed to my own weariness. What was going on? What reality was buried in my stash of records? Would there be anything positive for me to report come June 2018? Instead of gleaning material to expand the second iteration of Black, White, and Mormon Conference, an event which, an event which was set to follow the overarching 40th anniversary of, 40th anniversary, anniversary, where are my teeth? 40th anniversary of the revelation, I found myself struggling to stay afloat amidst a torrent of painful reminders. Jumping forward to a few months earlier in this year, while still trying to deal with my angst, a small group of individuals met to discuss possible future steps we might take to move the topic of race forward in the LDS Church. It was shortly after that meeting that a second general generous opportunity was extended me with an opportunity to write an article for the church's Ensign Magazine, Ensign Magazine, Navy Roots here, never mind. It was suggested my topic should speak to healing individuals wounded by racism. What a marvelous opportunity, but what absolutely lousy timing. <laughs> It was an extraordinary author, one I did not take lightly. 
However, I declined. My own wounds were now open, and not only open, they had been festering. Given where my personal emotions were, it seemed impossible that I could fashion anything that might be healing for anyone else. It took God only a few days to work me over. He's very good at that. And I'm not as tough as I look. I buckled, called the Ensign editor and said, if that offer is still open, I'd like to give it a shot. As is frequently the case in publishing, time was short, requiring that we move forward as quickly as God would give me words. After all, he had placed me in this predicament. Three distinct essays were prepared, an A version, a B version, and a C version. The thought was that the A version had the greater chance of acceptance by church reviewers. Personally, I like the B version better, but considered that it might be too edgy for a church publication. C, that version was written just for me, knowing full well that it wouldn't stand a chance in hell of getting published. <laughs> <laughs> it was an absolute surprise when the Ensign's editor called and said that they actually liked both A and B. He noted that the A version had more currency, but there were elements of B which also res resonated with their reviewers. And so it was that the healing words of racism appeared on the official church blog. A somewhat, somewhat modified article, shortened for space, was also prepared and can be found in this month's printed ensign. I quote from them now. Talking with one another about physical ailments such as colds, the flu, broken bones, and sprained joints can help us learn how to find healing. However, we also benefit when we address the challenges of incorrect thoughts and attitudes, including words and actions that harm others as well as ourselves. Some have felt the sting of being considered the other, or the lesser. It seems to me that such attitudes have increased in the world around us in recent years, perhaps due in part to the vitriolic language that has come to permeate political speech in various nations around the globe. Nothing could be further from the teachings of Jesus Christ than for any human being to think of himself or herself as somehow superior to another human being, being based upon race, sex, nationality, ethnic origins, economic circumstances, or other characteristics. Racial and cultural bias is too widespread in the world. Sadly, the practices associated with racism and prejudice have caused deep wounds for many. I wrote, as we endeavor to heal the wounds of racism, it is critically important to understand that negative ideas towards others based on racial or cultural differences hurt not only those who are the focus of such attitudes, they hurt the practitioner as much, if not more. We as Christians, disciples of Christ, we are Christians, disciples of Christ, yet when we allow the attitudes of the world to infiltrate our minds to the point of blindness about their existence, we limit our progress toward that which our Father expects us to become, and we enter into a sin that often has lasting consequences. That is the end of the quote taken from Healing the Wounds of Racism. Note, the first words cited were, some have felt the sting of being considered the other or the lesser. That sentence forms the cornerstone of the more difficult portion of this evening's conversation. If what has been said thus far might be considered as setting the stage, we now move to the play. It will not be a linear, linear review, 
or a topical review. Rather, it will be a sketch of those comments and attitudes which confronted me during the review of countless documents, images, and videos. Obviously, most of those observations reflect the past, but given the heightened racial tension in the nation today, statements and attitudes from the past are pertinent to our community today. One of the more interesting finds was a series of comments made in a targeted publication authored by Elder B. H. Roberts of the First Council of the Seventy. The official topic was a course in theology. We're going to do some reading here, and uh, we'll see how well I do. Pardon my eyes, but uh, let's see. We're going to start at that point. At this point, we hear someone exclaim, not so fast, to sit at the table, to mingle freely in society with certain persons, does not imply you would marry them. Certainly not in every case. We may recognize socially those whom we personally abhor. This matters not, however, for where, wherever social commingling is admitted, there the possibility of intermarriage must be also admitted. It becomes a mere question of personal preference of like and dislike. Now there is no accounting for taste. It is ridiculous to suppose that no Negro would prove attractive to any white. The possibility would become actual, as certain as you throw double, double sixes in dice, if only you keep throwing. To be sure, where the number of Negroes is where the number of Negroes is almost vanishingly small, as in the North and in Europe, there there the chances of such help me. Thank you. Are proportionately divided. Some may even count them as negligible. But in the South, where in many districts the blacks outnumber the whites, they would be multiplied immensely, and crosses would, uh, would follow with increasing frequency. But some may deny that the mongrelization of the Southern people would offend the race notion, would corrupt or degrade the Southern stock of humanity. If so, then none of such has yet to learn the largest writ lessons of history and the most impressive doctrines of biological science, that the Negro is markedly inferior to the Caucasian, is proved both chronologically and by 6,000 years of planet-wide wide experimentation. And that commingling of inferior with superior must lower the higher and just is just as certain as the half sum of two and six is only four. Next. Did you notice anything missing? The truth. <laughs> the truth? <laughs> Can we go back two slides, Tom? Another one, another one. One more. One more. Let's read what this is about. Lesson, what? Eight. The law of the Lord in ancient and modern revelation applied to the American Negro race problem. And if we go back one more slide. The 70s course in theology. What in that which we read has to do with theology? And if we can catch up with where we were, Tom, did you notice anything missing? The focus was on sexual and social interac interaction, not rights to the priesthood. Over the years, there has been much speculation as to the origins of the former priesthood restriction. Questions not only about when it originated or who originated it, but the motivations of its proponents. 
O'Connell O'Donovan is a self-described independent scholar who focuses on both LGBT and African American Mormon history. His research has led him to the following conclusions. Colonel speaking about Lester Bush. Lester is noted in his pivotal 1973 article, Mormonism's Negro Doctrine and Historical Overview, quote, an aversion to miscegenation, race mixing, has been the single most consistent facet of Mormon attitudes towards the Negro. Though the attitudes towards the priesthood, slavery, and equal rights have fluctuated significantly, denunciations of interracial marriage can be identified in discourses in virtually every decade from the restoration to the present day. I find that interesting. Here is a sampling of an email that came my way. Hey, I'm hoping you can help me with something. Our ward has a lot of young mixed race couples and our ward had one mixed race older couple. Had. A couple of months back, they stopped attending church. I ran into them around town two weeks back and lamented that I hadn't seen them at church. The husband, a black 60-year-old man, confided to me that he and his wife had been getting grief from older white members of the ward for being a mixed-race couple. That's why we moved out of Bountiful, he said sadly. There are consequences to the attitudes we take. Of course, the major reason given for the restriction, both from official sources and lay members, is that God had given a revelation instructing or instituting the ban, a denial which only applied to a single ethnicity or race, that being blacks descended from Africa. some voiced by general authorities and official spokesmen for the church. In the main, their views parallel those we just heard from our brother. An element of my personal disquiet with such statements comes from having known and interacted with those general authorities and spokesmen. This would be an appropriate time for me to offer a disclaimer. In reviewing comments from the past, which were made by officials and leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, it must be noted there has been no intention of besmirching, belittling, or demeaning those gentlemen in any way. And I, I draw a special attention to that. As I was reviewing some of the minutes of the First Presidency, I, I realized something. While I disagreed strongly with conclusions they were reaching, I saw them reaching in an honest manner, trying to find answers where there were no answers, at least not that they knew. And so I, I want to acknowledge that those men were trying their best to do their best. And uh, I don't condemn them. I wish they had been more in tune to a spirit of God than they apparently were, but I, I wish them no ill. It has been especially troubling to have the blame for the restriction placed at God's feet. 
An all too lengthy review of the first presidency meetings shows the vast majority of the citations on the subject of Negroes fall back to the known printed statements made by President Brigham Young. In several cases, they actually gleaned from earlier first presidency meetings, which included President Young's comments. A scant few speculate that Joseph Smith is the source of the ban. And some attending those meetings made the assumption that God is the author, while the most prevalent attitude is one of uncertainty. For me, the greatest infraction of all was the effect these early offerings had on impressionable young minds. A troubling series of articles appeared in an otherwise marvelous publication, The Juvenile Instructure, largely written, edited, and produced by Elder George Q. Cannon. I read through 48 issues of the bi-weekly journals and was very impressed by the range and depth of their concepts, all except a series entitled Man in His Varieties. How well can you read the text there? <laughs> Can you read that at the top? Next in order stands the Negro, Negro race, the lowest in intelligence and the most barbarous of all the children of men. The race whose, in whose intellect is the least developed, whose advancement has been the slowest and who appear to be the least capable of improvement of all people. The hand of the Lord appears to be heavy upon them, dwarfing them by the side of their fellow men in everything good and great. The Negro is described as having a black skin, woolly hair, projecting jaw, thick lips, a flat nose, and receding skull. He is generally well made, well thank you. <laughs> and robust, but with very large hands and feet. In fact, he looks as though he had been put in an oven and burnt to a cinder before he was properly finished making. I'll leave it at that. This was being taught our youth the youth of an earlier day. And I'm afraid that I remember an old truism from the Wild West, when water was scarce and distances were great, you didn't poison a well. Lives depended on that water being available to all who passed through. Looking at the materials I have, I feel that the well of knowledge, of attitudes within the body of the church was indeed poisoned and we're suffering the consequences of that yet today. Another surprise tenant of my large staff stash of material was one which at first seemed not worth my time as it involved another Christian faith, the Seventh-day Adventist. However, after giving it more than a glance, I found a treasure trove of related material. First, as we all know, that the LDS Church was founded in 1830 by its first prophet, Joseph Smith, Jr. The Seventh-day Adventist faith was actually a contemporary faith, having grown out of the Millerite movement in upstate New York in the 1840s. The official date of creation for the Seventh-day Adventist is May 21st of 1863. One of their co-founders was a woman named Ellen G. White, and she steered the direction and tone of that faith throughout her life. Sister White was also a committed abolitionist, putting her views out there for all to see. The Adventist movement caught my attention because they approached the yet enslaved Negroes in this nation in an entirely different way than did the Latter-day Saints. 
The following is taken from a biography of Mrs. White found at the Faith's official website. Introduction. Ellen Gould White, 1827 to 1915, was a co-founder of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, a global community of more than 20 million as of late 2016, and an individual that Adventists hold operated in a prophet prophetic capacity. The span of Ellen White's 87 years was critical for the fledgling republic that was the United States of America, and equally for African Americans, whose approximate population in those nine decades grew from 2 million in 1827 to 10 million in 1915. In the voice of Ellen White, the Seventh-day Adventist Church had prophetic commentary on those monumental developments. Developments, as was the very as the very length of this compilation bears out. White was prolific in her writings on slavery, the Civil War, Reconstruction, segregation, Jim Crow, race race relations, and the Black American experience in general. In particular, she stressed Adventist responsibility to repair the egregious wrongs and injustices perpetrated on African Americans by engaging in systemic efforts to the South to educate, evangelize, and better their quality of life. Beyond this, White was cogent of the cognizant, I'm sorry, of the progenitors of the African Americans and their history. In her writings, she discovers she discusses Africans in the Bible at length. Remarks on African societies in the Middle Ages and those contemporaneous with her. Throughout the span of her life, Ellen White maintained friendship with African Americans, kept correspondence with them, lodged at their homes, spoke at black churches and schools, and raised thousands of dollars for programs for blacks. A pretty remarkable woman and a history that we should be envious of. I offer that view of Sister Ellen G. White and the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a contrast to my own church and its approaches to the descendants of black Africa. Certainly that period of our nation's history is problematic at best. But when we, Latter-day Saints, attempt to justify our approach to Negroes due to the harshness of those days, we stand convicted for our lack of Christian charity and Christ-centered love. Sadly, following the death of Sister Ellen White, the devil of racism made itself known among the Adventists as they ultimately became as racially biased as most Christian churches in America. So, where are we along this 54-year journey toward racial equality in the Mormon church? You may have noticed that there have been no stinging quotes from President Brigham Young, President John Taylor, Elder Alvin R. Dyer, or Zebedee Coltrane. Only a lone video sequence has attributed the past restriction of Mormon priesthood to God. The possible chorus of injured voices has been represented by a single written plea from one individual. This has been no oversight on my part. I am more than aware of our troubled history and the pains it has rendered. Thanks to the confluence of circumstances and time, I have been a part of official studies which examine in close details those times and their aftermath. So why haven't they been spread out before you? The truth is, at the beginning of my preparation, all of those points were to have been. I even created a special folder on my computer into which elements of all of the above were gathered and edited for inclusion. But to par paraphrase from an old movie, a funny thing happened on my way to tonight's lecture. <laughs> Some might call it a come to Jesus experience, but another name for it would be the marvelous event 
which took place only 28 days ago. The B-1. The B-1 celebration, sponsored and fully supported by the Brethren of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Returning to the beginning of this lecture, I recall my closing words to Bob Goldberg. Quote, that said, while so much has been accomplished, there is much more remaining to be accomplished and to be acknowledged. It is because of those things which have transpired, those things which decades ago were less than a dream, that today I harbor magnificent hopes for our future. The B-1 celebration was my come to Jesus moment, and it refreshed those words that a flawed child of God had written, that today I harbor magnificent hopes for our future. Now for a few of the views from that wonderful evening. When we consider what has happened in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and the lives of its members since 1978, we all have cause for celebration. Institutionally, the Church reacted swiftly to the revelation on the priesthood. Ordination the temple recommends came immediately. The reasons that have been given to try to explain the prior restrictions on members of African ancestry, even those previously voiced by revered church leaders, were promptly and publicly disavowed. Institutional policies or practices that could have inhibited the full integration of members of African ancestry such as the separate congregations common in many Christian churches, were prevented by the continuation of the long-standing LDS policy of ward membership being determined geographically. Similarly, membership records continue to make no mention of race or ethnicity. The Lord has spoken through his father and his church away. In contrast, changes in the hearts and practices of individual members did not come suddenly and universally. Some accepted the effects of the revelation immediately and gracefully. Some accepted gradually. But some in their personal lives continued the attitudes of racism that had been so painful to so many throughout the world including the past 40 years. Others have wanted to look back, concentrating attention on re-examining the past, including seeking reasons for the now outdated restrictions. However, most of the church, including its senior leadership, have concentrated on the opportunities of the future rather than the disappointments of the past. As we look to the future, one of the most important effects of the revelation on the priesthood is its divine call to abandon attitudes of prejudice against any group of God's children. Racism is probably the most familiar source of prejudice today, and we are all called to repent of that. But throughout history, many groups of God's children have been persecuted or disadvantaged by prejudices, such as those based on ethnicity or culture or nationality or education or economic circumstances. As servants of God, we have the knowledge and responsibilities of the great plan of salvation. We should hasten to prepare our attitudes and our actions, institutionally and personally, to abandon all personal prejudices. As President Russell and Nelson said following our recent meeting with the National Officers 
of the NAACP. Together, we invite all people, organizations, and governments to work with greater civility, eliminating prejudice of all kinds. End quote. Tom, can you hold? Yes. Thank you. I want to take a moment here before we go to the last two clips. Those words being spoken by President Dallin Oaks were words I never expected to hear come from any general authority of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I don't want that point to be missed. It is a new day, and we can't just look back. I'm an amateur historian dealing with professional historians, but it's in my heart and blood to look back, to assess, to analyze, to give me a greater appreciation. But we can't focus our lives on the past. We need to let the past teach us so that we can move to the future. Oh yeah, that's coming. <laughs> We are going to end this right. <laughs> Sorry, I'm <out> work. <laughs> I threw a monkey wrench into the works here. Uh, we're I need to ask you all to ask if you're so good. Master, which is the great commandment of the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is my master. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments, and all the law and the prophets. Again, in 1831, this instruction was revealed to the prophet Joseph Smith in the Lord said, And that every man has seen his brother as himself, and that is virtue and holiness before him. Then, by way of emphasis, he added, And again I say unto you that every man has seen his brother as himself. In the meridian of time, and again in the latter days, the Lord has stressed his essential doctrine of equal opportunity for his children. And tonight, as the Lord has reminded us, the Lord denied none that come unto him, black and white, bond and free, male and female, all our life and God. On every continent, across the aisles of the sea, faithful people are being gathered into the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Differences in culture, language, gender, race, and nationality fade into insignificance as the faithful enter the covenant path and come unto our beloved Redeemer, the Lord Jesus Christ. Ultimately, we realize that only the comprehension of the true fatherhood of God can bring full appreciation of the true brotherhood of men and the true sisterhood of women. That understanding inspires us with a passionate desire to build bridges of cooperation instead of walls of separation.
It is now time to party. <laughs> Tab choir. center will never be the same. <laughs> that, let the church say amen. amen. I want to add one bit to that amen. My talk that I started months ago and set aside because it couldn't come to a conclusion because my heart had become burdened with what I had read. I couldn't come to a conclusion because in the passage of time, there had been that. <laughs> that celebration. It changed me. And my takeaway, and the takeaway I offer to each of you, whatever the wound, however deep, whatever the source, However angry you are, and however much you might want to fight, it's a time to heal. And it's the time to bury our weapons. Thank you very much. Darius has graciously agreed to answer questions. We have set up in the front two microphones. So please, if you have a question, queue up behind the microphones. I only ask one thing. You ask your question, and then you depart from the microphone. <laughs> Are there any questions? Oh, we're going home early.
early tonight. <laughs> yes. Where did you grow up at? I, I refuse to grow up. <laughs> I've heard there's no future to it. <laughs> I uh, was raised by goodly parents, having been born of goodly parents. Um, my parents were from part of the South. Mom from a little town in Arkansas, cotton plant. I don't know if you get any more Southern than cotton plant, Arkansas. Dad was from a small town in Missouri, Marshall. And uh, if any of you know what a sundown town was, is, uh, it was a sundown town which meant all Negroes needed to be out of town by sundown. And there was a separate community outside of Marshall called Penny Town, named after Joe Penny. My parents, um, with their southern background, taught me southern manners, but they did so in my home state of Colorado. I was raised there in Colorado Springs, Colorado, in um, a very loving family, a supportive family. But even in the West, uh, the vestiges of racism were present. Um, as an offtake, I remember that the largest city park was Monument Valley Park, and it was only three blocks from our home. And uh, in the summer, there was the public swimming pool. And for many years, Negroes weren't allowed to swim there at all. And then ultimately, we were allowed on Wednesday. <laughs> And on Wednesday night, they drained the pool. So the white patrons would have fresh water that had never had the taint of a Negro. So the question is, where was I raised? Colorado Springs, Colorado, in the West, with a Southern upbringing. <laughs> Sir. Uh, many uh, younger African Americans speak of you as a mentor and as someone who has helped them to navigate their way in Mormonism. And I'm curious what you've learned from them. I've learned a ton. And that's the beauty of age. Again, um, you don't only look back, but you look forward. I learned that um, the world is in a better place and in safer hands now with the young African Americans in the church than it was at the beginning. Um, I've learned that these young Latter-day Saints are well prepared knowledgeable, energetic, committed. They have what we in the faith call testimonies. And they're not shy in the sharing of those, but more importantly, in the living of those testimonies. So I see that in them and I'm heartened. Um, pardon an old man, but you wonder if what you've worked for and toward will have any carry through, follow up. And in my case, the answer is yes. The future is safe. You've spoken about the B1 celebration as a healing experience. What do you see as these, the future public, are they public celebrations? Are they different kinds of things, ceremonies? Could they, what do you see in the future to perpetuate that healing? Excellent question, and it's sort of an interesting answer. The, the first part of the answer that I would offer is that I don't think it's going to depend on public events such as that. But what uh, Elder Oaks in particular spoke about, about our personal one-on-one -on -one interactions, how we look at each other, how we treat one another, uh, what we think about one another. If we follow that counsel, the rest will take care of itself. But I'll give you an example of why it's important what you have in you. 
During the angst of all this preparation, I, I was seeking solace uh, one day a few weeks back and I went to the Jordan River Temple um, thinking that there would be salve there for my wounds. And there wasn't because I had forgotten what I really knew. What you take in is what you get out. I wasn't prepared to hear the Spirit of God. I was too concerned with my hurts. So when I came out of the temple, I sat on the little concrete bench there and I realized the answer isn't in the temple. The answer is in me. I don't know if you've mentioned this, but would you mind sharing uh, your feelings about that moment you knew about the revelation <laughs> and w what it feels like to look back on it now in 2018? I didn't believe it when it was first told me. Um, there was no way that was going to happen. Uh, I had given up expecting that that change or anything like it would occur in my lifetime. And so at first there was disbelief, and then when it was confirmed to me, uh, I was excited beyond belief. Um, and I think the most tender moment I have of that experience was um, I wound up at the church administration building, oh no, the office building it was, and I was looking for a friend, Dr. Heber Woolsey who uh, was serving as director of public uh, relations for the church. I don't remember what his title was, his director or such. Heber and I had um, taken assignments on a number of occasions in the past uh, from the brethren to go out and to speak to groups uh, that were troubled by the church's past policy and stance. And there was one person in the world I wanted more than anyone else to share that moment with, and it was Heber Woolsey. And um, his office was in that uh, tower, office tower, and it overlooked the Salt Lake Temple. And Heber and I stood there arm in arm in tears, realizing that the world had <laughs> totally changed and would never be the same. And also, in a flash, understanding that that revelation changed not only that moment or the future, but it also changed the past. The church has done extraction of names for decades. In years past, if a name was found to be of Negro origin, it was put in a basket, so to speak. That temple work was not done. I became aware of that and was involved in making sure that those names could now, would now, go through the temple. So that event, that revelation, tied the past, past the current, to the future. It was a marvelous day. One more question. Yes, ma'am. So, hi. Hi. <laughs> you owe me lunch. <laughs> what was that? You owe, let me be clear. You owe me lunch. racism and the struggle is being able to stay in the gospel or moving forward like how do we combat that like how do we I guess move forward because um, this is a two part question I feel like the transition of our society and seeing that you know the levels of struggles like in our faith as well as outside our faith and not being able to find solace like how do we get that if I heard the question in its entirety enough to answer, and forgive me if I'm not hearing it well, again, I think the answer is in us, uh, if I'm understanding the question well enough. 
we will be impinged upon by negative forces. We will be impinged upon by unavailable opportunities, things that we would like that don't seem to be within our grasp. I believe the answer is in how we cope with that. Not that it will be easy or pleasant. I don't have any panacea, um, but it's, it's really about us. And, and that has been a lesson I have learned in the last few weeks better than I thought I, uh, or I thought I had already learned and knew. But the answer is within us. There's an old black song about don't let nobody turn you around, turn you around, turn you around. And I echo that. Whomever you are, whatever your position in life, be comfortable in your own skin and who you are, what you believe, what you feel worthy to do. And don't let nobody turn you around. Thank you. Just the final word before you depart. Tomorrow, the doors open at 8.30. The conference begins at 8.45. In this room, we'd love to see you. Drive carefully, and just join me one more time in thanking Dr. Rice.